14.7 million uh, vaccines have arrived. But yet we know that in America, they're now beginning to vaccinate 3 million people per day. Almost no government, whether in Africa or elsewhere in the world, even in Switzerland where I'm based, is not at all ready. We need to have the conversation about equity. How many countries have received vaccines and how many more are coming, fingers crossed, in the not too distant future? 22 African countries uh, and 14.7 million uh, vaccines have arrived. Uh, but uh, the biggest challenge, and you really speak about equity here. But for Nigeria, for instance, Nigeria has received 3.92 million vaccines for a population of over 210 million people. But yet we know that in America, they're now beginning to vaccinate 3 million people per day, per day. So where is the equity in that? Quite a majority of the respondents actually believe that this vaccine is important. They believe that uh, <clears throat> it's quite um, effective. However, safety is their major concern. You know, safety remains a major concern for them. To address vaccine hesitancy, we need a, a coordinated, collaborative approach to ensure that all our stakeholders are connected and aligned with clear, consistent public messaging and governments to understand the value of vaccination. So there is a whole system below the healthcare practitioner that really needs to be enhanced and informed in terms of the vaccination processes, the safety of the vaccine, and uh, so much in terms uh, of the vaccine in order for acceptance to be achieved within the communities. Information access is really critical, particularly during a pandemic. Now, more than ever, the need for communication, the need for advocacy cannot be emphasized further. Information has been completely democratized. Uh, people can align with stories now that, that resonate with their humanity as opposed to uh, any kind of narrative that is only being shared by whoever has the deepest pockets, which is basically what media used to be. Either you can buy a front page or you don't get heard. Do social media platforms have a responsibility to tackle misinformation and be held responsible for the content shared on their platforms. There's a shared responsibility across various stakeholders. You have NGOs, you have, you have NGOs, you have industry, you have governments, you have schools, education, but also the institution of parenthood. Uh, but I think, as a, uh, for, but mainly speaking from Twitter's perspective, um, you know, if you look at, if you take a look at our product policy and partnership and philanthropic initiatives that we've launched um, during, during this pandemic, uh, you will see that we've allocated quite a lot of efforts uh, to combat the issue of misinformation. If we don't reach the people who UHC is really about, um, how can we ensure that digital technology um, is really used to democratize health and to transform both delivery and accountability of health services so that we actually leave no one behind? More than 3,000 Rwandans are accessing care through Bebel Health, and which is using AI to triage calls to healthcare centers. You know, that's an interesting application of AI within the healthcare space. You know, Zipline is, is delivering COVID-19 tests and vaccines in Ghana, you know, as we speak. Uh, more than 2 million uh, Africans are receiving access to essential medicines through m technology. We'll have to think about our community health workers. How do we incentivize them? How do we equip them to be able to use, let's say, digital solutions that are relevant for their context, that they can be able to have that data collection, know what to do with it, secure it, be able to refer on that platform. Are African countries ready to embrace the future of digital tech for healthcare? Almost no government, whether in Africa or elsewhere in the world, even in Switzerland where I'm based, is not at all ready. And the reason why I say that is that most policymakers in government still have a very analog mindset in a digital age. Yes, 
in in the sense that at a governance level, at a recognition level, at understanding that we do need, let's say, um, mostly just digital platforms and digital health to be able to progress the agenda of UHC, the recognition does exist. Do you see health tech ushering in a shift in global politics, the geopolitics of our region, or fostering greater regional cooperation in managing things like disease outbreaks or delivering um, routine healthcare services? I think we need technology by and large to ensure that that's happening, there's targeting. So the few resources that we have are directed to the ones who need it most at the right time. What kind of partnerships have you seen come together in this period uh, that are of note in transforming the way people and countries have responded to COVID? We were able to align very, very quickly on the messaging and the contributions that we wanted to bring to Kenya, which is very important to do with when you're going to be going out on a mass level to educate the, the, um, uh, the people of the country. Our, our reach globally, 3.3 billion people using our applications every month, means that we are acutely aware of the role we could play. And if you think about the nature of pandemic, so much of that is about getting health policy right, but it's also a big part of that is communicating that health policy. And I think we just play an important, a important role in doing that. This particular conversation really couldn't have come at a better time. Public health is under the spotlight right now and health systems across the continent are being stretched due to the pandemic. Few African countries have been able to meet the Abuja Declaration to commit 15% of their country's annual budget to the health sector. And nearly 20 years on, only a few countries in the region have reached this target. We are going to unpack global health decision-making. We actually have solutions that work for our people, that are contextualized, that we do not need to cut and paste things from China or from Japan or from Europe or from America. That is when the colonization of health really starts. They only need support to be able to get there because there are some gaps that you might have in some level of capacity and all of that. But what African countries really need is that person who would walk side by side with them, that person who doesn't come in with preset ideas, already made answers, creating parallel structures, prescriptive, but somebody who will walk side by side with partners, gets the work done and leaves behind lasting capacity. Philanthropy and private sector play the central role in providing mm. resources. Ubuntu, my sisters and brother, we are our brother's keepers and we demonstrated it with COVID. Even when we have young people sitting at the table, um, are they being seen as professionals? We do not have allies that can hear us as entrepreneurs, understand what we mean and what we can bring as value for them to to influence, to transform the rule. The first sort of aspect is that these people don't know what they're talking about. They're under qualified, they're under equipped, um, they're not able to be able to deploy a solution and uh, facility our size. Why do you think um, young people are considered as probably not as important a constituents when it comes to these policy um, dialogues and what do you think can be done to amplify sort of the discourse around that? Now we need to create new forms of coalitions with young people that are representative, yes, but that can bring something to the table to be able to make their structural change by being more representative and then to have our tool to, to lead. Leveraging our strategy from different partnerships um, to ensure that you can talk the same language as the client um, and ensure that in that way, um, you know, you can be able to get to the finish line and be able to deploy your solution. Mm -hmm.